Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar of the fall series. I see some of you have already found that poll option. I'm so excited. Take a minute, let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, as always, welcome to the CISW webinar offerings. My name is Alexandra Zanis. I am the Social Policy and Communications Coordinator here. Again, as always, I'm so happy to see all of your virtual names, and I hope that we'll have an amazing time this next 90 minutes. Before we get into the presentation itself, I just want to run through a couple quick housekeeping notes, which some of you may be familiar with. If you are, you can just disregard me. Maybe take a look at that handout widget and check what we have uh, in store for you there. If you're new to our platform, welcome. Everything on your screen is completely customizable. So take a minute and maybe resize some things for your viewing experience. If you're on a laptop, you may want to make those slides or the video smaller and you can minimize it and move things around so it's the best for your viewing needs. You should be able to find everything in that handout widget if you haven't already picked it, uh, clicked it at the bottom there. Uh, the handout widget will include things like the slide and additional other resources that may be relevant to the presentation or other CISW offerings. I have included as well, if anyone is wondering what to do for September 30th, it is Canada's first day of truth and reconciliation, the first year that we are marking that. On September 29th, we will be hosting a webinar with the Center for Indigagogy on decolonizing social work education research. So I left a link in there. Uh, you may want to attend that on the 29th in anticipation of celebrations and a day of reflection on the 30th. Other CASW webinars are included in that handout widget as well as part two of this incredible series. With all that being said, uh, please take a minute, find your course completion tracker. If you're looking for that certificate of attendance, that's where you'll find it after viewing about 60 minutes of this 90 minute presentation. Um, at the end, we will have about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A, but stay engaged throughout the presentation because we might be throwing you some questions during the presentation. But if you have questions, feel free to type them anytime in that Q&A box and I will be compiling them for a more formal Q&A towards the end. So don't you don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to ask those questions. Ask them as they come into your head and we'll compile them and move through the presentation together. If you have a minute, I would pop open that speaker bio. We are joined by such an incredible presenter today, and I'm so lucky and grateful to be joined by Sly. That presenter speaker bio will go through all of Sly's incredible experience, and we are so lucky at CISW to have them. So make sure you take a look at that, as well as some of those other widgets at the bottom there. So with all that being said, I think I'm going to switch to the results slide. Feel free to use that Q&A button to tell us where you're tuning in from if you didn't have a chance uh, to do so in the actual poll section itself. And with all that being said, Sly, I'm going to pass it on to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Alexandra. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Just gonna set myself up here. So. Welcome. It's such a, an honor to be speaking to you today and to uh, have a chance to share some of my practice experiences and knowledge and thoughts and theories over the course of my career. I'm assuming of you, uh, I'm assuming many of you will be at different points in your career, obviously. Some of you may have been here for, been in the field of social work or psychotherapy or care provision for many years, 30 plus years. Some may be around the 20 year mark like myself and some may be just getting started. Um, to those of you that have double my, you know, length of experience, um, I wish you well and uh, Godspeed in <laughs> may God have mercy on you and, and rest your soul and your weary spirit. Uh, I appreciate and honor your work as a legacy that has come before mine. And for myself, uh, you know, I am, am peaked in my career and feel like I have some good tidbits to share with you. And hopefully it'll be engaging from your perspective. And in terms of your experience and also for younger folks or for folks that are getting started, you obviously have probably quite often different perspectives than me and can challenge me and hold me accountable and also add nuance um, in ways that will enrich our field in the, into the future. So I'll just give a brief introduction um, of my work. And, you know, I am kind of uniquely situated. Um, I am a trans non-binary provider and I have been openly out as non-binary since the early 2000s and creating a lot of space uh, for queer and trans and two-spirit people to disrupt the gender binary in terms of um, access to naming them, their experiences themselves and creating space for their gender identification in a system and in a world that did not have or want to provide that space. 
So that's a part of my legacy and a portion of my work. And the rest is more focused on really, really hardcore grassroots, um, trauma-informed, uh, frontline mental health work. Uh, so working on the ground in Vancouver and the downtown south and downtown east side in various outreach roles <coughs> with folks um, experiencing structural insecurity, poverty, homelessness, houselessness, um, you know, restricted access to, to the basics of life and coping with complex trauma over generations. Um, the early part of my career, I spent a lot of time working with survivors of actually uh, colonialism and residential schooling. And so that was a, a lot of what shaped my thinking about how to provide adequate and uh, accountable and robust mental health care. And it still colors my thinking today. So that's good. You're going to see that woven throughout. Um, the second half of my career, I moved to Toronto and I've been working more specifically um, around addictions, mental health and trauma, and also just identity based mental health concerns. So looking at the layers of how different people's identities and positionalities and lived experiences affect their mental health and color the reasons that they're seeking support in psychotherapy. So the first half of my career is more around frontline care in various different roles on the ground. And the second half is more around psychotherapy and digging deeper and helping people manage the legacies of what they've been through and what they currently face. So that's what sort of colors my uh, thinking and my experience. Now, I'm going to move right along and just tell you about the overview for today. Um, so my goal and my hope, you know, an hour is not super long, but we'll see how the time goes um, and see how far we get. But um, yeah, my goal is to sort of really review how we look at mental health, um, how we conceptualize mental health, what have we inherited in terms of thinking about mental health and the mental health system and systemic responses and how we view mental illness or disorder or um, presentations of issues that clients may come into our care in an institutional setting with um, or find themselves in our private practices um, and things that they're coping with. So we're gonna take a good look at that today. That'll sort of be the overarching frame. We're gonna really reevaluate how we understand mental health and many of you may have already done this work, and so it'd be interesting to generate conversation around this. Now, a significant aspect of that is really questioning the assumptions and myths that have pervaded the medical model and the Western colonialist mentality that we have brought to working with um, expressions of pain and suffering, essentially. Um, and we're going to really sort of, again, tease out what decolonizing mental health care can look like and how we can shape our views to accommodate um, a robust view of the way people have been harmed in the systems that we are implicitly in and explicitly in. So we have explicit structures like institutions, government policies, um, ways of thinking uh, that color how people have access to resources and how they are restricted resources. And we're gonna get into that a bit more in terms of how that also interacts with mental health and functioning. Um, the intersectionality component just ties in to help us understand that there are multiple layers to identity and situatedness and lived experience. So it's not just one aspect of ourselves or our identities that uh, could be impacting our welfare in terms of how people receive us in the world or how resources are disseminated or withheld and how that harms us or how we might have experienced intergenerational pain um, and legacies uh, of colonialism, racism and the like. Um, and then we're going to pivot into more of a conceptualization of like, what is integrative psychotherapy? Um, how can we um, scale our approaches to really be adaptive to our clients' needs and not just um, keep our clients in a myopic view of a presenting problem in, in absence of any context? So we're going to really look at how do we integrate those layers in our thinking and in our responses. And part of that is we're going to really look at Classic symptomology has um, been presented in the medical sphere around, again, how we've classified mental illness and presentations. And we're gonna rework that and see if we can come up with some new understandings. So I hope this is engaging and fruitful for you and feel free to sprinkle your questions, comments, and whatever you like uh, throughout, okay? And I will field those intermittently, so thank you. In terms of some of the operating assumptions of the mental health systems that we find ourselves in in North America, um, in Turtle Island, and what have we inherited, you know, historically, and 
Also, what do we still find problematic in terms of supporting our clients? And the top things that come to mind from my perspective in my working history is this notion of, you know, um, presentations of symptoms are classified as a problem or an illness within the person. So the, the nature of a medical model is to view presenting issues as a problem and to situate it within the person and look at why, why is there a problem um, and to diagnose it, classify it, study it, um, to remove it often from context, social context, so that we can standardize care, right? Um, and offer treatment. So what I have found over the course of my career is that what tends to get lost is the situatedness of people, right? Um, we have not really super factored in the lived realities and contexts of people when we're interacting with them in the mental health system through a medical model. So for example, early in my career, I'd be working with folks who experienced intergenerational trauma, colonialism, residential schools would be uh, experiencing a lot of distress, a lot of challenges coping, um, rightfully so, right? And the, the task was to get them connected to a GP or a psychiatric team and to get them connected to medications. This was sort of the idea from the medical system, not necessarily from the frontline work we were doing, um, to get them connected, hooked up to meds, and then get them functioning better. And that is still sort of infused in our thinking about mental health care. There's an idea that, you know, if we just go in and we, uh, if we're allowed to speak to our problems at all, if we go in, we're um, having a struggle and we go to our doctor, um, that we will get a diagnosis of some kind that will help us make sense of our experience, and then we'll get some kind of treatment. And that's one of the biggest problems, actually, in providing care is that treatment is not super reliable and medical treatment is often not the best answer and what we find is that a lot of needs go unmet in entering the medical system and often there's a revolving door and we have you know we can see examples of that when people are in intense distress um, our systems are failing them and they end up in a revolving door situation even when they're feeling very precarious in their health and mental health now there might be differences across provinces and regions but that's sort of the theme that I've noticed in my history. So with that being said, with a medical model, there's also an over-reliance on diagnosing things. Um, and my biggest critique of that is simply that, yes, the DSM is helpful in that if it helps us identify patterns of functioning in a way, in terms of cognitive um, experiences, how we're thinking, how we're um, processing information, how we're viewing ourselves, um, if it helps us um, look at the physiology of, of what we're experiencing and make sense of that um, in terms of sleep-wake patterns, energy, agitation, um, things that we can't readily explain and, and cannot pinpoint to, you know, a, a present day trigger, for example, things that, that seem to be unwieldy for us but may come on for us in terms of mental health symptoms, it can be helpful in that sense. Um, you can get a little bit of clarity on what you're dealing with in terms of what's happening in your body, what's happening in your mind, um, what's happening for you interpersonally. Um, but it's still heavily focused on the body, mostly, and brain chemistry, mostly. And the idea that medications um, and maybe some kind of formalized, um, you know, best practices in cognitive behavioral therapy will help you to change the way you think, and then meds will improve your mood, and then voila, you'll be uh, on your road to recovery. And I have found that it's much more complex than that and that our clients and us as people too, also living in the system, are often not getting the care that we need to move forward and work with what is happening for us. So I would say um, the best way to consider the medical model is that it helps us um, identify that there's a problem and that we need support, um, but that we cannot rely on it to explain away what is happening for us and that there are root causes, okay? The diagnosis is not the root cause, and we're going to get into that right now. Please let me know if you have any questions or thoughts as we go. So a lot of what is infusing the way that we have approached mental health care is this idea of indiv individualism based in our capitalist structure, in our economic structure. We really expect that people function a certain way, that we have performance standards, 
that we work full time, even though we have a lot of employment precarity. But if, if we're working, we're working full time, we're working to the max, it's very difficult to take sick leaves. Um, often you're penalized for taking sick leaves, even in the medical profession as a medical provider or as a social worker, mental health worker, um, mental health leaves and sick leaves are restricted. Um, and often they're antagonistic processes that then cause further harm. So we have these expectations, again, societally, culturally, and structurally embedded in that actually are antagonistic towards catering to, to supporting our mental health needs. Um, and we often blame the individual as a result. You can't keep up, you're not productive, you're not functional. So there's a lot of shame um, and, and blame that gets infused in the narratives and stigma that we have and the actual responses that we receive from our employers, from HR, uh, from the, the culture and climate that we're in in general, good luck sharing with someone that you have a need to take a mental health break. How is that a conversation starter, right? So I'm just sort of peppering in my observations here around why it's challenging for us to actually hold space for each other when we're struggling and how can we shift that? And legacy of colonialism, this is a huge, huge factor. We have to do constant work, especially as white settlers, or any settlers on this land to really acknowledge and understand that genocide is actually not a project that ever ended, okay? It, the genocide of indigenous peoples was started and began or heavily was uh, happening during colonialism. Um, and the methods for taking over this land and treating indigenous peoples uh, were to eradicate their presence and their cultural practices and families and, and communities um and just systems um and so you know residential schools have been happening into the 90s as far as i recall and there is a collective denialism around that and suddenly in this past year we've had a little bit of an awakening a little bit of a reckoning but we still have not fully um made efforts structurally to make right um the harm that we've caused indigenous communities in in Turtle Island and, on, and in Canada. So we have to always, as workers in this field, understand that this legacy plays out for folks in ways that affects their coping to this day. And a lot of folks may be first generation survivors of res residential schools or their grandparents may be, or the, sorry, their parents may be. Um, so it's very much first generation, second generation in terms of that legacy of intergenerational trauma. And we're gonna get into how that affects people momentarily in terms of you know, mental health and wellness and coping and surviving. Um, also, if we look at other aspects of, um, you know, whiteness and, and superiority and supremacy, we also see that um, people of color, especially black folks, experience a lot of violence when they interact with the mental health system and emergency services. So quite often um, folks who are in distress actually will be seen as violent when they are not. Um, and will be reacted to with preemptive violence, as we've been seeing in the States and in Canada as well. We have a long history in Toronto of police shootings of people who are either um, brown or black or uh, experiencing complex trauma or even psychosis who are struggling, um, who, who experience um, violence at the hands of the mental health system, which is de facto the police in this case. So just to add to that, how do we work with that in our thinking as practitioners? Well, we have to really be careful and ethical in how we engage emergency response systems when we're dealing with people who are, who are really struggling with their mental health, maybe really struggling with reality and perspective and overwhelming distress. And we want to basically avoid calling 911 as much as possible. So that is one direct way that we can change the system. Um, but we have to think about better ways um, other than engaging 911 as a more robust response from start to finish. So, how's everyone doing so far? You can let Alexandra know if I'm going too fast. You know, um, I can slow down and pause. Any questions so far? I'm not seeing any uh, questions specific yet, but one of the comments that I found really interesting is I find with my clients, they're not on the classic nine to five. And that's an interesting. Sure. Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, many of our clients won't be right. Um, maybe they can't work or they're underemployed um, or they're trying to find employment and that sort of thing. What I'm more speaking to is the implication that we should all be able to be productive and have a nine to five and not mm -hmm. be able, you know, and, and, and to view that as the norm. And how does that affect our clients who are struggling with structural security or precarity in terms of their employment status or disability status? And, you know, what forces do they experience around exclusion because they can't work because of mental illness or because of mental health concerns or just a climate that doesn't allow them to work? And how do we, um, how do we reshape our thinking around productivity not being the basis for functionality? That's what I'm hmm. Thank you for Definitely. that. Uh, sorry, there actually is one question now. And for anyone else who's looking, there is a little button with two, um, they look like uh, quote boxes. That's the Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the questions is, um, and, and it, it's a great one. Do you find it's tricky to challenge these beliefs when you're collaborating with other providers, such as doctors or potentially even other therapists? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. It's one of the reasons I entered private practice and I'm very honest about that and direct. Um, I have found that in the past when I worked on interdisciplinary teams, it was very demoralizing to be quite frank with you. I think people are catching up and have been catching up around um, intersectionality and understanding the impact of systemic harms and structural harms, but it is still a medical model and doctors' voices are prioritized as um, having authority on matters of care and welfare. And emotional labor is often erased, negated, and misunderstood. So you could be doing copious amounts of emotional labor to bolster your client to help them um, manage the overwhelming systemic distress and interpersonal legacies that they have and they're coping um, and uh, and the work that you're doing to work alongside clients to help them stay anchored and uh, accessing care and moving forward uh, will just not be even understood or validated at all. And again, like I said, it's not a shared language and it's extremely invalidating and demoralizing. And so you have to find a way to make your allies and to infuse your own analysis in and take over or take back space that is sort of automatically just assigned to people that are higher up in a hierarchy um, of privilege, which doctors are, right? So um, I've sort of handled it by interjecting and doing some trainings when I have the energy to and going off on my own and working outside the system. You're gonna have to find your own methods if you're in the system as aligning with other social workers and other allies and workers that are willing to listen and hear more about how do we do this mental health care from a trauma-informed perspective and that holds space for emotions. Thank you for that question. Excellent. That's it for right now. So, Thank you. I'm going to carry on and we'll pause again soon. Um, ableism and insanism, this is sort of like, you know, uh, throughout. It's, it's just the, uh, it's sort of interwoven throughout how we understand mental health and mental illness. But the idea is that, again, even as people who are suffering, let's say I have something I'm dealing with, maybe I'm experiencing a bout of depression or um, just having a struggle functioning, when I'm thinking about myself, the idea of sanism and ableism permeating through here from our society, through our structures into individuals is that, you know, when we have clients at our door, the clients themselves have already internalized a lack of worth around functional impairments, if we call it that, or differences in when they're experiencing distress. And, and finding it harder to cope, like get up and get out of bed or, you know, organize their day or uh, find goals or be productive, look for work, all those sorts of things. Um, you find that folks have already internalized this notion that they are, even if they have politics that support disability justice, they will still have already internalized a lack of worth around struggling and, and not being able to have the energy and have the focus and have the ability to burn through your day and get things done um, in the ways that we collectively expect each other to do in a capitalist world. So quite often even folks who are on disability will be measuring their worth based on how productive they are or aren't. And those beliefs color how they relate to themselves. And that in turn will escalate per perhaps their distress, their isolation, how hard they are on themselves and that is a lot of the work that we do is going in and sort of operating on that, if you will, is to help folks externalize and hold space for compassion for themselves in an ableist, sanest system that does not want to see people take breaks, 
that does not want to see people be aligned with their emotions and their physical needs. And that we all, you know, the, the belief there that I would like to shift is that <clears throat> we all have a collective responsibility to hold that compassionate space, whether we're care providers or not. And I'm hoping that societally we'll start to get there. Um, homophobia and transphobia, this is um, a nuanced piece because um, there's so many things to say about this, but I'll just give you a brief overview. That, and that is that, you know, queer and trans people, lesbian, gay, bi, pan, true spirit, what have you, the whole gamut of the alphabet. We have gone through waves of oppression that are horrendous, um, that have negated and tried to quell our existence. Um, and, and we have been persecuted, to be quite frank. And that legacy of persecution, uh, based in fear of our sexuality, our preferences, our romantic orientation, our gender identities, um, that has a, a tremendous legacy that is different than other legacies in the sense that we have been often of a certain age and time and place. Some of us will have less experiences of this and some of us will have more depending on our age and location and identity and other factors. But depending on your time and age and place of birth and rearing and, and where you came up, um, you will have experienced maybe identity disruption, identity loss, you were not allowed to claim your sense of self in terms of who you were, who you were attracted to, uh, how you understood your preferences in the world in terms of gendered ideas of how you should be. Um, and many of us are still recovering from this process, particularly trans people and two-spirit people, and particularly non-binary trans people because we have been erased historically and that is directly tied to colonial ideals of binary gender being the most appropriate gender. So we are just now recovering ourselves from this and I am a living uh, example of this as are many others. And so when we're working with folks, we have to be very clear and aware and do a lot of exploring in our own lives around if you're not queer or trans or gay or bi or whatever, is to really understand this disproportionate legacy of persecution of our identities, how it's disrupted our sense of self um, our ability to be accepted by our peers from an early age, familial loss and being cast out from a young age quite often, right, in our teens, having to find and self-parent ourselves, even structurally from a young age, and also to try and claim ourselves in a broader society that did not want us to exist, and the levels of violence that, that, um, that folks have endured in order to claim themselves and still find meaning and still live a life that's worth living. So that's a lot to grapple with. And there's layers of family trauma connected to societal beliefs that then we inherit when we have our attachments to our caregivers disrupted for being cast out for those beliefs. Um, and then we have to look at how, how we've claimed spaces for ourselves and what has been that process of reclamation reclaiming ourselves from persecution and erasure. So that's something to be aware of. Now, if your client is not bringing that to you as the topic of conversation, obviously you don't have to make it the topic. I hope that's clear. Um, but you know, all of what I'm trying to, to cultivate with you folks is the idea that the more we investigate and the, the more curious we are around how people have been harmed, right? Through systems, through beliefs, through attitudes, through reactions, through our relationships, to our family members, peers, and each other, we're gonna have a lot more information to help people sort out and sift through where have they been harmed? How have they been injured psychologically, socially, emotionally, and structurally? And what can we do with them to work around this, to grieve this, to name it, to move through it, to hold them steady, and to find more resources socially for themselves to build more strength to carry forward in a way that feels best for them. Any comments on that piece by any chance? Yes, we definitely have some commentary. So I will dive into this if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, of the, well, one of the comments I'll just say uh, to get off the bat is thank you for that. Working with health authorities can definitely be challenging in this area within the biomedical preference to engage a biomedical preference versus engagement. 
Um, so that's just a little comment there. Uh, in terms of a actual question, uh, this one is a great question and I appreciate for all those asking questions that are, you know, difficult to ask, but do, do you believe that white therapists are in a position to provide new or even corrective experience for clients who have potentially been marginalized uh, by theories of racial superiority? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a fantastic question. And I think that the client decides, right? Unfortunately, if you're in a system, the client may not have, like if you're in an institutional system and there's only so many resources and you're a, a white social worker or a white therapist, um, and the client doesn't have a choice and they're assigned to you, well, that's, that's, that's shitty actually, right? Because you want to <laughs> give people the choice. But I think if you're in an institutional setting, the best you can do is your due diligence, which is to educate yourself around your relationship to colonialism, your relationship to white supremacy, your relationship to anti-black racism and all aspects of racism for different peoples of color. And to, and to constantly do that self-reflexive work so that when you're meeting with a client, you've already done that labor so that they don't have to question, or they will regardless, of course, because trust and safety building is involved, but they don't have to guess whether or not you've ever thought of something that has dramatically affected their lives so much. If you have not thought about oppression, structural oppression, colonialism, racism, and whatnot, then, then I agree you probably should not be working with folks of color who have experienced these things because you're absolutely going to do more harm than good. That's my, you know, that's my biased opinion. Um, I think we should be knowledgeable in what we're supporting folks around before we offer that. And we have to be very humble and let them choose us and be very clear about that. I'm here to be an ally and to do my own labor and contribute to this process with you so I can offer you empathy and care and understanding and hold space with you while checking my power and privilege as much as possible. But ultimately, if this doesn't work for you, I need to hear from you and let's find another alternative. And private practice is a lot easier because folks have already vetted you. So they will come to you because they already know that you have, an, uh, you know, um, you know through, the, through the telephone line or whatever, they, <laughs> they will have already understood that you've done a certain work a certain way and people have benefited and they trust you enough to come. And that's, of course, you have something to offer. I have my own intergenerational legacies and my own experiences to offer. And if it's working for folks, it's working. So that's that's what I would say to that. Yeah, I love that. Let the client choose. Um, and just an FYI to everyone that once you submit your questions, only us, only the present presentation team can see them. So please do feel free to ask the questions that are on your head. So thank you for that one. Uh, one of the one of the comments as well here is to check your bias all the time in order to understand. Yeah, and I mean, I think the operating, the operating assumption that I have is that I don't know what people's experiences are, but I try to do advanced labor to try and know and to try and be curious so that I can imagine what that might be like, even though I won't know what it's like. Um, and that's how I try to create knowledge and awareness and empathy to ask the right questions and hold that space with care and not re-inflict harm. Amazing. Uh, Sly, do you have time for one more question? Okay, um, really great one. Can you speak to the ways that social workers can navigate being a gatekeeper in the roles, especially in the medical model system? How can we minimize the harm caused by gatekeeping? The example they give is I'm thinking about trans and gender diverse folks accessing gender affirming medical care and how cis social workers are often the ones advocating for these clients. So just speaking to the gatekeeper role in general and potentially minimizing the harm of being a gatekeeper. I mean, that's such a huge question, such an important <laughs> question, and, and one that everyone should think about who is not trans, um, you know, because um, that is a huge legacy unto itself that has only recently been disrupted, and I have, and others have been a part of that disruption of um, making space for trans and non-binary people to access the care that they need, and, um, but even five years ago, um, I would be giving trainings, and I would have social workers that were known to be, or psychotherapists in institutional settings, that were known to be advocates uh, locally through, through colleagues um, for trans, on behalf of trans clients, and even they espoused beliefs in my trainings that I was shocked by, um, like, trans clients don't know what their gender identity is, that they are de facto the gender they were born with, that, you know, they're mutilating their body, like all sorts of garbage. And so, you know, again, it's sort of like an, a deconstructing project of like, how have you 
as a cis person with power and authority over someone's life in this regard, especially because you determine whether or not they can access medical care to change their bodies and change their experience of the world, um, you have a lot more power than, than you should. Um, and, and the role there is to, again, really focus on humility and really hearing from the client what they need rather than determining for them who they are and what they should do and why, right? Your beliefs about someone's body and gender uh, basically have no business uh, in terms of making the decision on their behalf. It's informed consent. Your job is to simply provide them a safe space to land and process through what they need and also give space for them to question and have ambivalence too, right? Like, there's this notion in the medical field that like, oh, trans people have to know 100%, 100%, I want surgery today, you know, whatever, and not have any anxieties, not have any beliefs, doubts, you know, and that's a huge disservice to trans people because it, it makes us swallow our suffering and makes us have no process and we just have to fake it and lie and get the surgery and then we still don't have an emotional process where we um, understand our own choices in a way that feels like it centers our agency because we haven't had the chance to process through the hard stuff. Um, so to be a gatekeeper or not, I think um, client-driven, informed consent, assuming most people will be able and capable of making informed consent, even youth, and that the story they tell you about themselves is true. And if you feel defenses around that, then you have to look at what are my biases and why am I thinking this way? Um, it doesn't mean that you don't share resources with clients to help them make decisions and things like that, but you're, you should never be the person invoking power over someone to say yes or no, you're trans or not, or whatever the deal is. Now that's a huge topic. We could do like six trainings on that. I don't know. If, I hope I've offered some thoughts on it. Um, yeah. Just a couple of the comments before I let you get back into the presentation is from Elizabeth saying, letting the client be the expert of their own story and experiences is so important. Um, and then Jane also says, I think it's also vital to be transparent about your lack of knowledge and take responsibility for personal education, not rely on the client to educate you. So I just want to flag both those. Yeah. I mean, those are just sort of ways of being that we should hopefully as social workers and other clinicians just try and adapt to because our worldview does not mean that's how the world is, right? And mm -hmm. our place of comfort and or discomfort that we avoid is going to be showing up in the sessions with clients. And uh, we really want to be checking our discomfort and grappling with that in our own lives, especially in this to minimize as much harm as possible by not projecting that onto our clients. So thank Absolutely. you for your comments. Okay, moving on. I'm going to, I've got a lot of content. I love this conversation, but I'm going to move on and we'll come back to more pauses and engagement, because I do appreciate that as well and, and love that dialogical aspect. Just quickly around misogyny, this piece. I mean, I'm naming it as misogyny in terms of our beliefs and, and how they're embedded in mental health systems, because one of the biggest problems I notice in my psychotherapy practice that people struggle with is that there is, there's never been space for their emotions or their emotional expression of anything that isn't just like nice, good, calm, plain, boring, something to look forward to, <laughs> whatever, right? So we have like generations of um, legacies of within our families of origin, um, you know, sort of conditioning us to suppress our emotions based on the structural conditions that our, that our parents and grandparents and their generations um, had to adapt to by quelling their emotional responses because there was there was no way to receive any care or soothing or attunement, and they just had to survive. So depending, we'll get to this in a moment, but there are generations and legacies of shutting down emotions, disconnecting from emotions, often from survival, that then have trickled down through the generations that have sent messages that are actually misogynist because they actually view emotional expression as failure or as weakness, or that vulnerability is somehow weakness or shameful or hum humiliating when actually um, emotional expression is powerful. It's beyond powerful and it has a lot of impact on others and holding space for emotions is a huge part of healing. So if we're doing work with folks, especially in psychotherapy, but also in any other clinical setting and we don't hold space for emotions, we have to check why we're doing that. Like, why are we trying to fix something without providing space for emotions? 
and connecting to feelings and offering that empathy. And we might have our own legacies of feeling uncomfortable providing that emotional space. And that is our work to do as well. But um, it is a key component. And the other piece to that is that we have to be very careful because our clients maybe have never had the opportunity to develop skills to actually just hold space for their emotions. Maybe some have, of course, but I found across the board, this has been missing for folks. They have not had the care to like settle into what they're truly feeling that isn't just positive, that is a harder emotion or more distressing. And to have that reciprocity in relationhood to be received with care and not be fixed or erased or to move on to the next specs, you know, move on to the bright part of your day. And this I find is a huge problem with us collectively and how we relate to people, whether it be professionally or interpersonally in the world. And we need to work on creating that space for each other because that is actually where we find healing. And we have a lot of feelings about that, I'm sure. So indigenous knowledge is I cannot be a spokesperson of any indigenous culture or community. All I can say is that I have reviewed some information and see some themes coming across, which is to say that, and it's not monolithic, every culture has their own ideas and traditions and concepts, but there are some common elements that stand in opposition to our capitalist Western colonial systems, which is to be in relationship with each other in different ways that create more care, more attunement, more um, co-sharing of resources and mindfulness in how we interact with each other. And that includes um, our physical resources and our physical uh, environment. It includes the other inhabitants that we share this earth with wherever we are. Um, and it includes each other in our families, in our communities, in broader society and how we interact with each other. So there's an idea of like a circle that everything sort of is in relation to each other and that different elements of our relationships hold different meanings. And as I said, that's just a broader concept, but the idea is that actually it is a total holistic view of wellness of person in relation to people in relation to broader environment. And that is how we can conceptualize um, what might need care and attention um, and changes in how we navigate these aspects of our world. So here's an example of a, a medicine wheel from Curve Lake. Um, they have different um, elements for different, um, for different portions of the medicine wheel. And they have uh, time of year, they have um, color and, and representational meaning and uh, different people's roles and stages of life. Um, they have different animals and plants and uh, regions. So in each quadrant, and I, I am not trained in this particular medicine wheel, but I will say I, looking at it, uh, would be curious to know what the meaning is and what is the symbolic reference. And also what are the teachings and values embedded in each reference and how do I relate to that? That's what I would be looking for personally. And I would take the leadership of any indigenous elders that would be willing to have those conversations with me live in person or to indigenous peoples or clients, or I continue to do my own reading on that. But it's a beautiful representation of holistic health in a sense and yourself in relation to all cycles um, of the environment that we're in. Um, so we're going to pivot a little bit and start to look at what is you know, how do we reconceptualize? I'm sort of giving you a lot of um, things to consider when we're looking at how people have been harmed. And that's really important in terms of what we do with the issues that people bring to us. But the whole idea is that we want to really shift this idea of like, it's the individual person um, disconnected from their environment. It's just that one person and they have somehow failed to compensate for whatever is troubling them in their lives. And and they must bear the burdens of that. So we, we see that when we are working, especially in institutional settings, we see clients coming in for social work, for case management, for medical care, for psych psychiatry. And, you know, when we finally see them, they have been failed over the course of their lifetimes in terms of the co-elements that would provide or could provide balance and harmony to create wellness and welfare. So we, you know, folks have been um, isolated over the course of their lifetimes and given the burden of holding up their own survival, uh, disconnected from each other, 
with overwhelming legacies, and they've been coping the ways that they have tried uh, their best to do. And I'm talking about sort of a more extreme presentation of like, you know, folks that might end up more in permanent sort of state of housing, houselessness or difficulties there, or just have complex legacies of trauma that really make it hard for them to, you know, stabilize their housing or make relationships or manage their mental health. Um, folks that are at that phase in, in their survival mode, they, um, they've already had legacies of being left alone with the problem. The problems that they've been given from society and, and the imbalances in society and, and uh, due to structural oppressions. So this has created a lot of fragmentation and a lot of isolation. But when we do see folks, we can still do really good work and help them connect back to themselves and hold space for themselves differently and interact with other people and build trust and safety and the like. So a key question here is what actually has been out of balance? If we're gonna really look at mental health as a whole system of how we relate to systems and people and each other, um, we have to look at what has been out of balance resource wise, what has been out of balance in terms of safety and belonging, what has been out of balance in terms of ability to self-actualize opportunities for you know, abundance um, and welfare. And yeah, where have we uh, experienced disparities that have created harm that then people show up in distress with? I'm just gonna take a pause. Any questions on that so far? Yes, <laughs> it's a it's very engaged audience today. I am, I am so grateful for all of you and, and your incredible questions. Um, one of the one of the questions that I have specifically um, would be, uh, sorry, there was there's two versions of the same question. How comfortable are you with the silence? And I like that question because I think it's important in terms of speaking to some of the things yeah. we've been talking. Sure. Yeah. And I, that question is awesome because uh, one of my worst and first experiences in receiving mental health care was around silence. So I'll share with you just a tidbit of that, which was when I was in my early 20s and needed some support, I went to a psychologist and I, this was in the early 2000s. I had no reference points for mental, for my own mental health in terms of like how we think of mental health. And what happened was, is I paid her a lot of money to sit in an, a leather couch and she said, sat there and stared at me for an entire hour. And she was a tall woman, a serious looking woman, a woman that had more economic class than I did. And I had a lot of trauma and I sat there and I was extremely off put and intimidated. And after two sessions, I never went back. So that's one example of how silence actually maybe could be damaging for folks. Um, at, in the extreme. And that is sort of like the classical ways that I have thought of psychotherapy in the past is like sitting in silence and letting the client do the talking. Now, again, like I said, that was super extreme and I found it super off-putting. Now, sitting in silence could mean also, yeah, we shouldn't just problem solve everything to death. Maybe we just actually need to hold back from moving ahead and managing everything in the moment with the client. If we tend to do that, pull back and really focus on listening so that we don't get ahead of ourselves in the process with the client and we can come back to our own attunement with our own emotions as we're sitting there holding space for people and use that as again curious questioning or, or curious prompts for questioning once the silence has given the client enough time to digest their experience right if it's meant to slow down and titrate overwhelm and give people breath to move into alignment somatically in that moment and they can tolerate it that's something to actually be very conscious of how you use and yeah filling in the space might be counterproductive actually it's really on balance there's a whole yeah. it's like a palette you can choose right how you approach that yeah, that's a great point. And Jennifer says facial expressions can also matter when you're delivering care. So I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> As anyone who attends any of my webinars knows, I am very expressive. So uh, that's a comment. I wanted to just, I just want to give a quick little comment here um, before we continue to go into it. And it's that I've worked in a community for 30 plus years. Um, it is on reserve. And every single day, I still have to earn the trust of my clients. 
absolutely absolutely I respect and, that, yeah. and yeah and that takes a lot of heart from a provider and a personal standpoint to show up and be courageous and do that but it's so important because what it does is it shows that you are constantly being accountable mm. you're constantly paying attention and you're trying, I, I hope, right, to be attuned and adapt to what the client is saying about their experience and needing, not just to take for granted that you know something about them and that you're welcome to support them, right? Because again, they're well, if you are not of that community yourself, you're an outsider and this is a time limited pass, right? You have to continually earn trust because the harm has been done already and you might have been, or you're your family or your peers or your, you know, people in society of your same, you know, uh, lived experience might have caused them harm. And or your profession. Absolutely. <laughs> so the work is grounded in colonialism. That was how we began, right? So we have a lot to undo. Yes, um, I do want us to keep going with the presentation. I could stay here and read comments all day long, but I will save some of them. Uh, please do feel free to keep asking those questions. Unfortunately, if we don't get to your question today, I'm so sorry, there are a lot coming in. There is a part two of this though, so make sure you register for that. Uh, and yeah, I'm just gonna pass it back to you, Sly, so you can continue on with the presentation. Sure, yeah, and I might hop through different sections to expand differently given the time constraints. So trauma-informed understandings, that's a component of integrative psychotherapy um, in that trauma-informed, you know, historically we have thought of trauma as a single incident. And uh, again, it's been a very medicalized psychiatric approach to trauma um, in that it's, you know, it's always been like some major catastrophe or like, let's say war or being, uh, you know, an army veteran or being in a a, a catastrophic event of some kind. And that's how we have thought of post-traumatic stress as a disorder um, and how we have understood trauma. So trauma actually, eh, the lack of understanding of complex trauma ha has been really harmful for folks um, who actually have broad experiences of harm that they've endured. And so trauma-informed understanding simply acknowledge that there are generational impacts of violence um, and that, um, you know, if you are in a situation where you cannot escape and you are being harmed, that that is also traumatic. And you can look at this through many different perspectives and ways in society, whether it be like stepping out your door and feeling like you're going to be perceived in a way that people are going to be hostile towards you, um, whether, you know, it's about um, being excluded from various opportunities, whether it's about who people, how people react to you as a desirable subject in the world, whatever the case is, these are all aspects of trauma uh, based on how we relate to each other. And that is, that is our beliefs about each other actually shape how we treat each other. And that is where we experience a lot of violence and harm. It's not just the domain of the extreme catastrophic event. It's often psychosocial and emotional in nature and happens all over time with many events. Um, and we'll talk more about that, but we're integrating understandings of, you know, uh, social systems, structures, oppression, colonialism, and our interpersonal relations in our understanding of like, what is trauma and what is harm and how do we get affected? So we talked a little bit about this moments ago, assumptions of care in a trauma informed approach. Um, basically that, you know, we are not, Look, we are, first of all, very mindful of the power that we hold, depending on our own lived experiences and positionality within the social sphere and social structure. Um, we have to be, uh, as with the, the previous comment, very, very mindful and humble and like very much using our power for good and being very aware that we have power to use and that that shapes our interactions. And we have to be always trying to usurp that power in the dynamics with clients while not diminishing the fact that we have it. So that's a balancing act and, and takes a lot of skill, um, but it's a wonderful thing to offer clients because it actually vulnerabilizes you in many ways to serving their needs and to serving them um, and um, creates a level playing field, even though, you know, um, even though it's still in many ways transactional based on the system. But the idea is that you will give your power over to the client as much as possible and use the power for good and, and, and use your resource access to benefit them rather than restrict um, access for them. 
in terms of like um, our expectations of what we will achieve with folks or, or what space we want to hold with them, the idea is not that we help people cope or function better with what they're dealing with. That might be the client's goal actually, and that's okay. We always wanna respect and honor the client's goals. But if we zoom out again and have a systemic lens, we don't want to make it so that when clients come to us for uh, you know, holding space for any of their traumas or anything like this, that we expect them to just problem solve their way out of it and, and just function better. And I think the task is to really um, lay off the individualizing of functioning better. You know, there's been this whole discourse over the last 10, 15 years around self-care, right? And it's been, it's come to the point where that term is probably triggering for trauma survivors, right? Around this idea of like, oh, just self-care your way to, you know, not being in a constant state of grief and loss or whatever, right? Not experiencing gender dysphoria or not experiencing anti-black racism every day and being in despair or what have you. And so, you know, so my point is that res the focus on individual resiliency is actually uh, adds more burdens for folks in terms of coping and functioning. And that is not the right approach. If the client wants to function better in life, that's, that's on their terms, but it's not us expecting them to hold more alone uh, and to function better and not have any space for what is troubling them. Um, we often, we also have to keep in mind that when we're supporting people around trauma that, you know, no matter what layers and levels of harm that they have experienced underneath that is usually a relational wound. Like something has been disrupted or rendered inaccessible in terms of a relationship with a family member, family of origin at large, relationships with people in your own community, um, relationships with people who, who you choose to be in relationship with in your adult life and your relationship with yourself. So unaddressed emotional harms that collectively there's been no space to hold are underneath a lot of the work that we're going to be doing with folks. And this is a very interesting ethical piece to manage with care is that we, we need to hold space for people without plunging them deeply into their wounds. And that is where we actually hold a lot of power and a lot of discretion and need to develop a lot of skill. The idea from my perspective is to be aware that there are many emotional wounds potentially that people hold in themselves as a result of relational and structural harms. And that those wounds are likely underlying the, the thoughts and perspectives and beliefs that they find themselves struggled with when they are coming to therapy, for example or even for a case management session, those emotional wounds are gonna be coloring their experience, how they're coping, and what you see in terms of whether it's depression or depressed mood or heightened anxiety or mixed traits um, or whatever their struggle is, it's often connected to unaddressed emotional wounds that at some point we have to understand as practitioners and gently weave in to help the client understand that there's something there to attune to, to give themselves some self-compassion around, give back and externalize um, narratives that have harmed them, that have been given to them structurally and interpersonally, and to, you know, release um, a punitive stance with themselves. And that is when that, that sort of stage of work happens after we've done a long period of building trust report and moving slowly and safely with people to hold space for them. Um, but it's just something to point out is that often when we have, again, presentations of illness, whether, however we conceptualize it, there's usually long-standing emotional harms. And our clients often are unaware in the sense of they've been so gaslit and so <laughs> invalidated about the harms that have been done to them. Um, that they just think that they have to try harder to not feel pain or grief. And it's not congruent to the immediate thing in their life, so they don't understand why they're feeling it for so long. And that's where we have a lot of work, care work to do to help people give themselves space and compassion to really process some of that. This is just, I'm gonna move into um, a graph here. This is just for us to keep in mind that the legacies that we hold are very much affected by the context shaping our parents, 
and grandparents' lives. So depending on your, you know, your life story, right, and your family's life story, um, and depending on what happened in your parents' context, social context, and what they endured and what they were coping with and managing, um, really shapes and affects you. And what their parents were enduring really shapes and affects um, their legacy. So basically, you are, as a person in the world right now, um, shaped by um, the time period in which your grandparents were children. And for some folks, it's even way more recent than that, right? And whatever might have been the case for folks in your parents' generation or grandparents' generation, now maybe you don't have trauma in your legacy, how lucky for you, wonderful, privilege, great. Um, but many of us um, have legacies of war, genocide, colonialism directly in our lineage, um, and could be first generation survivors of, of parents that have survived war and genocide and traumas. Um, and, and we're left with the legacies of how they coped and so forth. And so, yeah, we are affected by probably 150 years worth of social context in terms of what we are holding in ourselves that has been passed down through coping through generations in relation to social context. So my big question then is, you know, how do we conceptualize, you know, this idea of harms affecting us, right? If we're tasked with doing one-on-one -on -one work with folks, if we're doing psychotherapy, if we're doing any kind of supportive counseling that is mixed in with case management as well, it's going to come up in some ways. You know, what is the problem and what are we working with? And I always sort of maintain a split or many splits, but layers of observation, which is I work always with what the client brings to me as their stated concerns and issues and challenges. And that's the face-to-face -face level. That's on the surface. That's what they bring to me. That's what they know. And beyond that, I'm always thinking, you know, invisibly moving through that structural piece, the piece around oppression, colonialism, intergenerational trauma, familial legacies, whatever, and their own experiences in the world moving around, right? As we talked about earlier, racism, homophobia, whatnot. Where might injuries occur based in the harms that people have faced? Is the injury in trusting others? Is the injury in the family of origin in terms of the relational dynamics with parents because they were struggling? Is the injury around self-esteem and self-worth because of societal devaluation of you as a person or your family or your group or class of people that you belong to or race or country of origin? Where does the injury occur? And how does it show up in your life? And again, the purpose is not to necessarily go straight into the wound, but it's to hold that in your being as a concept to go, there are probably reasons deeper than what the client is presenting to me that I can be somewhat curious about and attuned to, to build some connection to the things that they share with me. So for example, if they're sharing negative beliefs about themselves or the future or their capacities or what they're enduring, you're always looking for the links of where did they learn this about themselves? And often it will be a societal message passed down through families and then enacted upon your client. And it will also come full circle in when they leave their family environment, they will experience it in the world interpersonally and structurally. You know, people make up institutions, people make up government, people make up these structures that we have to navigate. So it's always something that people experience, an attitude, a reaction, a, um, a lack of an opportunity, a negligence, a diminishment, or an overt aggressive harm or threat where people might have understood themselves to be less valued because of the devaluation in relation to others. So we want to be curious about where has the devaluation and or dehumanization or injury occurred in relationship to others? And how can we provide a soft space of landing so that we again don't plunge people directly into their wounds, but we say, hey, you know, is it possible that these beliefs that you are t sharing with me about yourself today, have they been shaped anywhere? Where have you heard these messages before? Because we want to get really conscious and compassionate with those messages to help folks offload some of that guilt and shame.
while still coping with it, right? Where do the wounds reside? Again, how are people harmed? Does it show up in their relationship with themselves internally? Does it show up in their critical voice? Does it show up in how they speak to themselves? Does it show up in how they relate to their own emotions or expectations of functioning? Um, does it show up in relationships where it's very challenging to be in a healthy dynamic in a safe space with people? Does your client have challenges regulating their mood and then, then it comes out because they're experiencing triggers in their relationships in harmful ways that they are trying to navigate and, and reconcile? Are they re the recipient of harm in relationships and disruption there? Um, is it more uh, of a family legacy? Is it more of an emotional aspect? Um, where, where does a client notice their challenges? Usually what I find is that there is something happening in relationships beyond the, the greater social world in their immediate lives. There's something about relationships, usually with a partner or significant friend and or they're just struggling to cope with their own thoughts and underlying emotions that are not consciously within their awareness. How do we cope with our wounds? I think, again, this is a question that I am asking us all to consider um, because when we, again, classically think about medical models of mental health and our stigmas around mental health and functioning, we have not viewed people as like trying their best to function and, and cope and thrive. And anything that we consider a mental uh, illness or diagnosis is actually just a manifestation of trying to cope. On a physiological level, quite often our bodies are um, experiencing hyper arousal, hyper arousal or hypo arousal. So they're um, revved up to anticipate threat and harm, or they are, um, becoming less aroused to sort of slow down and stay away and isolate and withdraw. And what are, you know, if we're looking at what challenges people are having, it will usually be a product of having to cope with something. And there will usually be a reason for why it's happening the way it is, whatever the presenting concerns may be. So what I'm suggesting and, and what most of you probably already know is that there's usually a function to what people are doing, no matter how we view that thing that it is that they're doing. We might say, oh, that's a very risky thing, or that's a harmful thing, or you're, you're being self-destructive if we weren't critically analyzing this. But the idea is that people are always trying to cope, even if it's ending up badly for them, even if it's further harming them, there's some unmet needs there that need attention. And that's where we can help folks go in to try and meet those needs. Um, let's see, I, I'm going to skip ahead, but I would just want to take a brief, uh, question if that's okay and see where th folks are at. I would love to actually move into like undiagnosing certain illnesses to sort of deconstruct classic symptoms and things like that and prepare us for the next time we meet and how to really move in with working with a trauma informed integrative lens with presenting issues that are common. Um, but I want to hear right now how folks are doing and then we can decide when to have further questions. Yeah, so everyone is doing very well. They're very um, engaged and intrigued by these uh, slides and additional information. Um, one of the comments is definitely about building rapport uh, and building rapport before bridging into immediate therapy, which can sometimes be um, you know, it can sometimes be harmful, and especially for individuals that have collective cultures, etc. Um, but one of the questions is, what percentage of time do your clients actually relay the details of trauma uh, mm. versus focus only on the impact of it? Mm. That's a wonderful question. Um, so again, that could be its own workshop, but I think that when folks come in, um, how I sort of understand where they're at with sharing is usually if they're in the middle of dealing with complex violence, trauma, legacies, um, a current context that is structurally violent towards them, whether they're like, you know, fleeing some situation um, or whatnot, they will usually be very verbose about what the details of their trauma are because they are so pressed with trying to manage it all. 
and they have nowhere often, this is again, a select group of people that I've worked with that have dealt with a lot of trauma and structural violence, but they often have no like re social resources where they don't have those relationships established over time. They've been broken from their own need to flee wherever they've been uh, you know, harmed and they won't have anywhere that they can connect with another person to share the stories. That's a certain class of people. Another class may be more silent, but when folks are very verbose in the details of their trauma stories, I actually find that my task is less about engaging them around question and answer and <laughs> reflection because they're not in a reflective state. They're in a state where they need to actually like collect themselves because their body and brain are on overdrive and they are just experiencing a lot and they're trying to process it however they can. And there's a lot going on for them. So my task as a provider is more to be mindful that if they want to tell me a lot about their de details of their trauma story, they're probably hyper traumatized right now in this moment. And they might just need me to actually listen as much as possible. Now, if you find folks circulating over and over and over again, the same things that are currently happening and you really don't have space to ground or unpack and things like that, you might have to do over the course of several sessions, a little more structured intervention around, okay, I noticed that we're cycling through this again. Can we pause on that for now? And let's, if it's okay with you, you had mentioned this thing over here that I find really important and interesting. Do you think it's okay if we spend a little time on that just for the next five to 15 minutes? And let's see if we can slow down. And your role would be to sort of just help them parse through one thing that they want to circle through if they're going through five different things that they're very verbose about and try and slow it down. And if they get overwhelmed in the slowing down, probably because they may be more in contact with emotions, then your task is to help them ground in the space so that they don't get so flooded and overwhelmed that they feel fear because they may need to dissociate um, or they just might be filled with emotion. And there's all sorts of strategies for helping folks with that. Now, if folks are not talking about trauma details, um, there's a whole range of how people approach these things, but like I, I personally believe unless the client purposefully wants to speak about details of trauma, I don't think it's a good practice to actually actively go there because I have found that you're going again into the details and the reenactment of where the wounding occurred. And unless there's a structured plan over time after you've built rapport for a year or two <laughs> to do this work, and you don't have any goals and you're just wandering. It's like, it's like um, stepping on mines, right? Landmines. You don't want to just find yourself exploded with a landmine because now the person is just activated and, and there's no plan of what to do with it. Um, so you have to be very, very careful around, you know, opening up trauma memories and traumatic details. Um, and depending on where the client's at, you take their lead and say, you know, here's my concerns. Here's my thoughts. What do you think of this? If you want to talk about traumatic events, let's look at, is there a way to scale in to the things that have been hardest for you? Can we start with something a little lower on the intensity gradient and work our way towards that with a plan in mind of how to ground, how to manage the emotions that come up and things like that. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, another question would be around um, your own personal disclosures. Um, and what you believe or what you feel about personal disclosures, um, specifically in, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, and client-centered therapy. Uh, and do you find them to be helpful or do you stay away completely from them? Yeah, um, I think that it depends on your setting. If you're working in a setting that's more institutional and you're more working with marginalized folks in terms of the structural pieces in their lives, um, and they may be more fragmented and less experiencing of support out in the world interpersonally, you have to be um, very aware of the impact of your own vulnerability and transparency and sharing. Because, you know, if you're focused on building rapport and, and safety and relationship, and clients are lacking relationships in their lives and are quite isolated, they will naturally, of course, if they're feeling safe with you, want to attach to you. And that's a natural part of working with people. But if um, relational needs are not met elsewhere in their lives and they're really in distress and very isolated, 
it's only natural that they may want to get their needs met through bonding with you. And that can be very precarious in terms of managing boundaries and clients' expectations of you and what you share. So if it's a situation like that, you have to be very careful to share actually minimally, unless it's maybe from a cultural standpoint relevant or from like, you know, an oppression based standpoint relevant, obviously. And the idea is it's not so much about you and what your feelings are and what you've endured, but it's more like the context of knowing and transmitting a sense of like, these are the thoughts I have when I think about this thing. And what do you think about that? Does that resonate for you? And if you say, you know, if you want to be more direct around like, you know, how I was earlier in this presentation around, I had this experience, here's what it was, you know, be very clear around like, I'm sharing this directly because it's, it's very hard to say in any other way. And are you okay with that? Is it okay if I give you a disclosure right now around this piece that you're bringing to me? I want to see if I understand you properly and then share and then use that as a generative platform to bring it back to the client and for them to engage with. Because often we actually understand ourselves better through how people share their understandings of their lives too, right? But it shouldn't take over the space or the process and it should be limited and contained and managed with care. Mm, that's such a great point. Yes. Um, so I'm just having quite a few questions coming in as well about the certificate of attendance. That's that little check mark button at the bottom there. It's called a course completion tracker. Once you've hit that required viewing minutes, it may take a bit, but you should be able to download it directly from there or else check your email. Uh, sometimes it comes a little bit later in the email than when we um, end the webcast, but feel free to check there uh, or log back on at any time and you can download it directly from the platform. So we have about 15 minutes left of this scheduled um, presentation slide. You tell me, what do you, what are you thinking? We have questions for days or you can continue. Yeah, I mean, I think what I'd like to do is just go over one or two more slides and then what we can do is I will actually use the rest of this presentation as the basis for our next conversation because it's gonna take us to the same places we wanna get to um, and, and, and so be it. Um, and so, so for just, anyone uh, there, introduce. I'm sorry, just for anyone there. So there's a bit of a lag in our system. So sometimes we talk over one another. But for anyone else looking, there's a handout widget at the bottom there that you can register for part two or download the slides, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, in that little handout widget. Um, so I'm just going to flag that for you. And then yeah, go ahead. Sly. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um... I'll just end on the note of like, yeah, whatever folks have experienced in terms of harms in their lives is going to bleed through into their day to day experience and how they understand and relate to themselves. Now, we're going to get into a little bit more about like how attachment, rupture and abuse in families of origin or neglect in families of origin lead to a rupture in like attunement with a caregiver and how that sets people up for um, relationships and stances with themselves that are more or less shame based and how we can work with that when they are coming to us because that is a very hard and difficult piece is when folks are finding their own internal voice very uh, self-punishing or their own behavioral choices seem to be leaning towards very self-punishing on purpose because they believe that they should be punished um, we want to be able to understand the legacy of that and why the relational stance with themselves is so punitive um, and we're going to connect that to different ways that that might manifest in terms of the classic diagnoses and how we can rethink that. But um, yeah, I will open it up to questions uh, in general, and we'll try and get as far as we can with, with your curious questions. Excellent. Okay. And sorry for everyone. I'm flipping back between a couple different tabs I have open here. So just bear with me. Um, one of the ones that I really love, actually, it's, it's a little bit of a comment, but I think it'll dovetail into some other questions. And it's, as an Indigenous therapist, I often encourage non-Indigenous therapists to learn about our history in order to really understand their clients. I often open my knowledge base to my non-Indigenous colleagues on how to work with Indigenous clients. This isn't really a question, rather just a point I wanted to share, so thank you. There's lots of learning out there and I encourage everyone to partake in workshops to learn about this history and provide a culturally sensitive paradigm, especially with Indigenous clients. Thank you. Just to say that little note. And, and such a wonderful, generous offering to offer that to your to your colleagues, right? Colleagues. You don't have to do that, but it's so generous that you do. You know, um, 
So that's that's such a gift. Um, but you know, for the rest of us, yeah, we shouldn't necessarily rely on <laughs> on our indigenous mm-hmm. colleagues or or our clients in that regard. Mm-hmm. But what a lovely offering! And yeah, there is a lot to understand, and, and that understanding of events is how we cultivate empathy. Right? We cannot cultivate mm-hmm. empathy if we are not curious to try and understand another situation. Excellent, excellent, yeah. Okay, on to another point. Um, and this one's interesting. Uh, if you can answer it, excellent. But how do you work around when clients don't want to disclose details of trauma because it's been deemed culturally demeaning? Hmm. I know. Um, I guess I'm looking for a little more information around, you know, I, 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 I would have to know a little bit more, I guess, about you know, what is the nature of the thought around why it's demeaning. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't have an easy answer. I, I would need a little more information on what you're thinking of there. If you want to add, that would be helpful. Yeah, so if that individual would just like to add a little bit more. Yes. Um, it, it's true. It's interesting when, when individuals are experiencing that kind of cultural, um, you know, uh, baggage that can come with the way that we respond to therapy or what we disclose or choose not to disclose. Um, I understand. I, I'm, I am assuming that's kind of where that's going is there's, there's a cultural feeling of, um, like it not wanting to disclose anything, but uh, anyways, I'll, I'll await maybe some clarifications there. Mm. Okay, yeah, uh, this is probably too big I of mean, a question. I'm oh, sorry, go. No, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Okay, this is probably too big of a question, but I'm wondering how we as social workers can reconcile our anti-oppressive beliefs with the role of social workers collectively, especially in the ongoing colonization processes. So how do we reconcile, yeah, anti-oppressive beliefs with the role of social work? Um, so how do we actually disrupt the role and legacy of social work in terms of colonialism, I think? Is that the question? Like, how do we change the collective culture of social work? If that is the, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If that is the question, then I think that, um, you know, we have to just do what we're doing here and educate ourselves around, um, you know, where do we hold power as a profession and how is our professional culture shaped, right? We actually have a lot of organizing we could do actually in the systems that we are in and especially our professional regulatory system. And there have been many ways in which I have had to practice outside of the regulatory structure of social work in order to support clients to the best of my abilities and to meet their needs. And so we actually can do a lot of advocacy within our own professional associations where we can meet and participate and be active participants and do trainings such as this, right, like that we're doing here today and share our perspectives and start to create a different climate and culture that is interrogating the power structures and our roles within them. And, uh, you know, that's part of what I'm trying to do here today. And uh, we just have to be engaged in our own learning processes and see where we can make inroads with our colleagues um, and take the lead of what our clients are saying about our profession. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, this is a good question. I always love when these questions come up. Um, How or what do you think social workers could do to create more awareness or advocacy for people who are living with either mental health illness, like mental health illness um, or stigma that is facing them regarding you know, priorities for treatment, healthcare services, the child welfare system. But how do social workers get more engaged? Yeah, I mean, if if you aren't already fully engaged, which I'm assuming many of you are, um, you know, I think the idea is that, you know, in a neoliberal funding structure and system politically, we always want to reduce services, right? And the whole 
idea there is that we're saving money. And I think social workers have a tremendous role politically and institutionally in disrupting that and in um, actually reorganizing and lobbying for the reorganizing of finances to support different modalities within communities um, for healing um, and resourcing and um, and to take it out of an emergency response system where our hospital systems find themselves trying to meet the needs of people with you know intergenerational and colonial based traumas and they, the service provision is not there right it's not going to be in the emergency ward and so what are the community-based alternatives that we can support and divert our attention and our resources and our clout and our access to to mobilize to support because it's going to happen on the ground in communities and we could have a role there to play politically to advocate alongside folks for that if that's what they wish absolutely and what i will say um you know your professional association wants to hear from you what you're doing on the ground as well because it does influence our advocacy at the national level uh, we do just have a new government as many of uh, you in canada may know we went through an election process that on monday gave us a new government with hopefully a new mandate so now would be the time for you to use all the channels you have to advocate for the kind of country that you want to see. Um, so I hope that, you know, if, if you don't know the ways already, that you start looking into some other ways to advocate, uh, be it municipally, provincially, or now federally, uh, to ensure that we're trying to change those structural uh, barriers to what we're doing. Okay. Um, so this is an interesting question. What are some resources that you have um, that could help or point in the direct, or could you point them in the direction of those resources uh, for more trauma-informed care uh, work? Um, I have linked through some resources in the PDF handout. There's a few there to get you started. Um, they do focus on uh, some indigenous-centric resources and um, and I can actually send you, I was going to send it to you in my next uh, workshop, but basically a list of authors who have contributed to trauma-informed care and also who are coming from different positionalities and different perspectives and ways of approaching trauma, maybe informally in some sense, um, also from lived experiences. And you can work through that list. It's a list that I have found very helpful. Um, in addition to, and they're mostly authors that have really sort of added to the field. Um, and there's some links that I've provided in the PDF. But it's, it's, there's a ton of information. If you uh, Google Indigenous healing, Indigenous wellness, Indigenous mental health, um, truth and reconciliation, you will find tons and tons of information. Um, and yeah, trauma informed care, you will find tons of information. But I can send that author list out to you. Um, after this uh, call. Excellent. Yeah, um, and dovetailing maybe a little bit on that was given the systemic oppression at the base of so much trauma, do you feel it's our obligation as practitioners to engage in political uh, change that's geared towards greater social justice in our communities? I mean, uh, for me personally, it's never been a choice. Right? I have had to engage, otherwise I would not be here and I would not be uh, here as a, as a subject in, in the world and I would not be in the profession. So I also feel that way about my clients. If I did not adapt, if I did not um, <clears throat> push the boundaries of care and create new <coughs> ways of offering care that transform the system, they would be harmed actively, continuously. And I did not feel that was a moral choice. So I took in the information and I tried to build uh, a safe space with them and with other people thinking it along the same lines as myself and referencing them and integrating that knowledge into my practice and with the client's lead and using that as a basis for disrupting the way that you know care has been delivered historically, right? So it's been, it's not been a choice for me and I imagine that's the case for a lot of folks. Um, so yes, I believe it should be a choice and you can decide how to engage. 
That's a great point. Um, <laughs> for many people, you know, choosing to be apathetic is sometimes a very clear indication of privilege in a lot of ways. Um, yes. Okay. So we probably have time for one more um, and just uh, an overarching thank you for this presentation and, and clear excitement, um, clear excitement for part two. Uh, so thanks to everyone who was able to attend and read through and, and spend the next last hour with us. Um, the final question, and, and it's both a, both a question and almost a, a comment. Um, it's, do you believe, or in your experience, can psychological services in the medical setting collaborate to deliver a standard of care that could incorporate anti-oppressive, indigenous, and culturally relevant person-centered ways of knowing and being? And I've asked this because I've not witnessed such programs or delivery models. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I think that's the truth. And I think that um, I don't know where these programs are. I think often in certain nonprofit um, organizations, although I'm very critical of the corporate structure of these organizations, there has been some peer informed service provision that has been in consultation with communities. And I think that has been fruitful and challenging. Um, and I think if it's driven by um, folks who are peers and in community, that is a great starting point but um i think the professional top down you know we've researched this thing and we've decided this is the best practice and here's the protocol and here's how we treat you approach is pervasive and maybe helpful in some sense but not i find it time and time again it's not what people need what people really need is safe space where they can relate to each other and interrupt cycles of harm and experience attunement and that is the foundation for so much healing so that would be in conversation with the community itself in conversation with peers or a consultative you know cohort to establish uh, more appropriate programming right more culturally relevant programming Excellent. Yeah. And I often say that um, social workers and social work tend to be at the front of these movements. So hopefully we continue to uh, develop a lot of courses and materials and, and new ways of knowing and being as, as we develop and, and move through the world. Um, I want to offer so much thanks to Sly for this incredible presentation. Uh, I am going to give you the final words here, but for anyone else wondering uh, about part two, you can find that in the handout section where you can also find the slides from this presentation and other uh, downloadables or handouts from the presentation, uh, as well as some other stuff in that widget system there. You can log back on to this webinar anytime, whether it's later today or in a week or in a month, uh, through the same links that were sent to you in your email. Uh, and just, just be patient with that course completion tracker there. Um, we will pop in a Studio My Certificate button as well if there, there's some issues there, but just be patient with it. We have a lot of people on this call, so sometimes it takes a while to auto-populate with your information, uh, but I will be checking, so don't worry, you will get your certificate of attendance if you're not getting it yet. Uh, and yes, just an, a huge thank you, Sly. Any final words before we end today? Thanks, Alexander. Yeah, I'm so pleased to be here and to have you engage. And you know, I only got halfway through, so that's perfect. We'll, <laughs> we'll pick up next time and I'll lead you through further sort of um, case conceptualization as it relates to these structural pieces and what does that look like in terms of integrative approaches to psychotherapy and to care. So thank you all for showing up. I hope you have a fantastic day. Stay safe and I'll see you next month. Who knows? We might need a part three. <laughs> Okay, bye awesome. everyone. I'm down for that. Have a good day.